And uh, well, it is Father's Day, and as I uh, promised the other day when I preached a Mother's Day, I preached to the mothers. I said, well, uh, Father's Day is coming up, so uh, we fathers will hear a message on fathers today, amen? So, and uh, I was praying what to preach on and, and looking through the Bible, and there are so many great fathers in the Bible, amen? But today we want to go to the book of Luke, go to the book of Luke this morning, and we're going to go to chapter 8. I want to ask, how many know, how many people here know who Jairus is? Okay, Jairus. Okay, let me spell that for you. Maybe I'm not saying it right. J-A-I-R-U-S, Jairus. So how many of us know who he is? Well, I'm actually going to preach on Jairus this morning. Okay, I'm going to preach on Jairus this morning. And uh, you know, there's a lot of great fathers in the Bible. But I believe Jairus was a great father as well. And I actually titled the message, Me Jairus, because I didn't think we would know he w who he was. Because I really didn't know, and I was reading through Luke this week, and um, actually I'm, I'm reading through Luke, and then at the same time I'm doing uh, commentaries, different commentaries on Luke to understand the book of Luke a little bit better. So I'm using different commentaries and, and reading through it, and, and I came to, to Jairus and, and just to see the faith this man had, you know, uh, and it just amazed me, and I think we as fathers, we all need faith, amen? We do need faith, and I believe Jairus was a great father. You know, there are men the world regards as great. Uh, the world regards kings who have kept the peace or conquered territory, great men. The world regards uh, generals who have been great leaders and battled great men. Uh, the world regards athletes who have thrilled the spectators, great men. Now there I can account because I love sports. Okay, I love sports, I love baseball, I do. I like to watch baseball every chance I have. Uh, my son plays baseball so on Monday nights I take him there and I'm there until they finish. And I even go, go Tyrell, go Tyrell, you know. I love watching baseball. I do. And uh, so if the bases get loaded and a good batter comes up, the one that's good for home runs, and I'm, I'm just, and he hits a home run, that, that's called a grand slam. Oh man, I love that. I think he's a great man at that time. So the world regards a lot of men great men. But the view is different from above. See, God views men different than the world does. God views men who have come to faith in Christ great men. God views men who have been faithful to their wives great men. God views men who have been examples to their children great men. Okay? And that's what I want to talk about today a little bit. Men who have been examples to their children. And let's, let's go to the book of uh, Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse 40, and I'm going to go all the way to 56. Okay, chapter 8 of Luke, verse 40 to 56. And here we have the story of Jairus. Okay. Says, and it came to pass that when Jesus returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as she went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged, thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was 
Not hid, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to score, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should not tell no man what was done. So here we see the story of Jairus. Now we know who Jairus is. Amen? We see the story of Jairus. And Jairus was a father. See... Why should Jairus, why should we regard Jairus as a great father? That's what I want to look at today. Why should we regard Jairus as a great father? And I think we as dads can learn a lot from this. As I was studying this, and uh, I hope I was able to put it together in a way that we can understand it. I was in different commentaries uh, and, and, and the way um, I understand it. I'm hoping the dads will be able to understand why we should regard Jairus a great father today. See, Jairus did the greatest thing a father can do. Let's go to verse 41 again. It says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus. He came to Jesus. Jairus did the greatest thing any father can do. He came to Jesus. We as fathers, first and foremost, we need to come to Jesus with all our worries, with everything. But fathers that aren't saved, they need to come to Jesus so they can bring their problems to Jesus as well. Amen? But Jairus came to Jesus. And see, we see who he was as well. And it amazed me when I was reading this because it says, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. What does this mean? He was a leader amongst his people. He was a leader. He wasn't just any man. He was a leader. He had people working under him. He could have said to anybody, look, I've heard of this man that heals people. Why don't you go and tell him? But he didn't do that, did he? He went himself. It was important for him, as the father of that maiden, of that girl, to go himself, to ask for, to talk to Jesus for himself. Although he was a leader, he was not ashamed that all of the people that were there, and they probably, if he was a leader, all of them knew him, he was not ashamed. And how do we know that? Because what goes right the next a thing that's here, and he said, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet. What does that mean? He humbled himself. He came to Jesus, but he didn't only come to Jesus. He was humble when he came. He humbled himself before Jesus. It didn't matter to him who saw and who didn't see. Even if he was a ruler, he kneeled down before Jesus. How many times we as fathers, when we should go to Jesus because our children need prayer and kneel down before Jesus, we don't do that. So we can learn a lot from Jairus. Amen? How many of us fathers should pray for our children? I think all of us should. And I think we can all 
look at Jairus and say, man, he had courage, you know, and, and he humbled himself. He fell at Jesus' feet. And, you know, he, I, I imagine his heart was troubled because of the next words, and we will go there. He came to Jesus humbly with a troubled heart. Because here there was something in his house that he could not control. He was a ruler. He could control a lot of things. But now he brought to Jesus something he could not control. There was an upset in his house. There was an upset in his home. A problem he could not solve. And he came down and kneeled at Jesus' feet. Fathers, if problems come into the home, and we will go at what this problem was in a little bit here, and we read it, but we all have children. If we're fathers, we have children. Amen? And I'm talking more than anything to the dads today and to the dad figures as well. Because there is children that look up to the dad figure as the same as our children look up to us. You know, it amazed me when my kids, my boys were small, they always said, once I grow up, I want to be as tall as my dad. And here says da their dad, a short guy. But how children want to be like their dad. How important it is that we are a good example to our children. You know, when I look back, I failed in a lot of places. But now when I get up in the morning, my children are the first one that I pray for. And mind you, my children are saved, and I thank God for that. They're faithfully in a church, and I thank God for that. But I still need to pray for them that God would not allow them to go to places where they shouldn't go. That God will protect them from all harm. It's so important that we as fathers do that. That we as fathers do that. But Jairus here, he humbled himself, brought his troubled heart to Christ, and told Christ the problem that he knew he could not fix. He came to Christ because he needed the touch of God on the one he loved. Do you need the touch of God on your children today? Fathers, do we need the touch of God on our children? How many of us fathers, and don't lift up your hand, but today is Father's Day. How many of you, if your children called you and said Happy Father's Day, or if they didn't, how many of us in the morning went and kneeled down before our Lord and Savior and told God, I need your touch upon my children, upon my daughter Kimberly, upon my Father Dave, a son David, and up on my son Tyrell. How many name your children by name and told God that you need his touch upon your children? We as fathers need to do that. Amen? We as fathers need to do that. I am so thankful for the children God has given me. And I would imagine each and every one of you fathers is thankful. Let's tell God how thankful we are from here on in. Amen? Let's tell God how thankful we are. Today, they are healthy. Today, it looks like they might live for a long time. But we just don't know when an accident can happen, do we? We just don't know all of a sudden they're gone. Take the time today, fathers, to pray for your children. Every day, Jairus wasn't ashamed to do that. Jairus, if it would have been in a church, and it would have been an altar call, and if that would have required that, he would have been there. Because for him it was important to pray for his children. Amen? Amen. And it should be for us. See, a lot of times we're a chain. What will the people think? It doesn't matter what the people think as long as we know we are right with God.
as long as we know that in ourselves. Amen? You know, the greatest thing anyone can do is come to Jesus. And that's not just fathers, that's all. But Jared, Jairus, sorry, Jairus demonstrated the greatest example of a father's love here. See, he came to talk to Jesus about his child. Verse 42. See, it says, For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people found him. See, he came to Jesus to talk about his child. And as I said already, that's where we as fathers need to be. We need to talk to Jesus about our children every day. Every day. Because the most privileged children in the world are those whose parents pray for them. Those whose names are often before the throne of grace. How often are the names of your children before the throne of grace, fathers, dads? How often are the names of each and every one of your children before the throne of grace? Think about that. How often do I pray for my child? And not just one. Dads, how many of your children, how many of us have more than one child? I think quite a few here do. Amen? How many of your children are the same? <laughs> They're quite different, aren't they? My youngest one, he was, whoo, whoo, he had more energy than the other two together. But everyone is different, but yet you love each and every one. And so, as we love them, we need to pray for them. Because like I said, the most privileged children in the world are those whose parents pray for them. If we as parents pray for our children, they are privileged. And why? Exactly what I said. Because their names are often before the throne of grace. We need to bring their names before the throne of grace. Do we know how, what our children's names are? I would hope so. That means we can bring them before the throne of grace. Amen? We can come to Jesus Christ and bring him the names of our children and Lord, protect them this day. I don't know what they're going to do, but you do. Lord, I don't know if they're saved, but you do. And if they're not saved, do not allow them to die without Christ. Bring them before the throne of grace. Lord, whatever needs to happen in their lives, allow it to happen as long as they don't die without Christ as their personal Savior. Is that desire in all of us, dads? Do we want our children really to be saved? We need to take time, as Jairus did. He didn't want his daughter to die. I don't want my children to die. But you know, one day they will. But I want them to be saved so they can be in glory. Amen? And that's what I desire, to see my children saved, that they can be in glory. You know, we can pray for our children and expect answers. We can. That's cool. I'm going to go to chapter 11 here. And like I said, I'm reading through it, so I remember where this is. Chapter 11, I think it's verse 9 and 10. Luke. Yes, and it says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knock, uh, knocketh it shall be opened. So, do we believe God? So, if we pray for our children, we can expect those prayers to be answered. 
Amen? Because God promises he will. So we need to bring their names before the throne of the Lord. See, the most underprivileged children are those who grow up in godless homes. I grew up in a home, my parents would always say they believed in God, but they weren't saved. They couldn't teach me how to be saved because they weren't saved. And there's so many children today that grow up in a godless home. But also, the most underprivileged children are those whose parents do not pray for them. See, there's a lot of people that would say they're believers, but they hardly ever bring the name of each and every one of their children before the throne of grace. In other words, they hardly ever take the time to pray for their children because of their busy lifestyles. And we need to pray for our children. We have a promise in the word of God that he will answer us. Amen? He will give us what we ask for. You know, we know they are going to die one day. And I, I just want to share here again, and I've shared it here before, but I'm, I, it, it, it goes into the message, and I do want to share it today. Uh, Brother Iram and Sister Olivia Bueno in Mexico and the mission we started there this last time. This August the 5th, it's going to be two years. Their son was working in the oil field in Texas. And their prayer was always, he was already married, he already had three children and one on the way. And uh, 23 years of age. And they always prayed for him. They were saved there in the missions after, a little after we got there. And they always prayed for their children. God, protect our children. They would always do that in church. And they would always say, they always, every day, they brought their children's names before the throne of grace. And the, uh, Lord, if something happens, if they should leave this world, just save them before they go. Don't let them die without Christ as their personal savior. Their son had an accident. He was working in an oil field. He was on a tower about 30 feet above the ground. There's batteries there. They had to work there, and then somehow he saw that, this, that uh, uh, there were sparks when he got up there, and the, the company is supposed to have some kind of clothes for protection for these guys, but they didn't give it to him that day. And he saw what was gonna happen, and he just grabbed his pot, partner and threw him off the tower. 30 feet above ground, and as he jumped, everything exploded. He was thrown into the tank down there, and the fire in the tank, and everybody thought he was dead, and all of a sudden they see a hand come out of that tank amongst the fire. They were able to get him out of that fire. He should have never lived after an accident like that. Nobody could explain why their son was alive. Not one person, not one doctor. They couldn't explain it. They put him on a helicopter. It took half an hour from where he was to get to the hospital. They were taking him, and he was still conscious at the hospital. They called his parents after that right away. His parents had to go to the border, had to get a, the hospital had to send information to the border so they could cross, they, to know that it was true that they could go. So they went to the States. It took them 10 hours to get to the hospital, and when they got there, their son was still conscious. Somebody that should have never lived. 85% of his body was burnt inside and out. He was all swollen up already. And as they got the news, they called my wife and myself. And they asked us to pray. And we went there. 
and his mom and his dad praying, God, if he has to go, we're okay, but don't let him die without Christ. They brought his name before the throne of grace again and said, thank you for our son, but if he has to go, don't let him go without being saved. They went there. They went into his room. He looked at them. Couldn't move, but the eyes. They start, started praying with him. They asked him if he wanted to receive Christ, and the tears started rolling down his face. He couldn't say yes, but God held that man alive, 23 years of age, till his parents got there. His parents led him to Christ, and then he died. God answers prayers, dads. Bring your children before the throne of God, amen? Bring the names of your children before the throne of God, as Jairus did. How important that is for us dads to do. We should never forget to do this. It is so important because we don't know how long they are going to be here. We as dads are privileged to have children, but there comes a responsibility with that. Amen? God has given us those children for a reason, to be able to lead him, lead them to Christ, to show them how much God loves them, what the purpose for their lives on this earth is. It's to be eternally with God one day. Amen? How many of us dads want our children to be in heaven with us? I think all of us. I think all of us, and all the father figures here as well. Those children that look up to you, you want them in heaven. Amen? You want them in heaven. You know, and then comes the greatest test of a father's faith. See? He came to Jesus. He humbled himself. He brought his broken heart to Jesus. He talked to Jesus about his child. And then they started walking towards his house. Yes, Jesus was walking with him, but then something happened that kind of slowed it down. As we read the story, I think you remember what it says here. Let's read it, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. And sayest thou, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. See, something happened here. A lady that had been sick for 12 years. No physician could cure her. She had spent all her worldly goods. So even though Jairus was in a hurry to get to his home, his daughter was sick, now Jesus is healing someone else here on the way. But you know something? I think Jesus was preparing Jairus. I think when Jairus saw that, he grabbed more faith. Because he saw something happen there that nobody else could do. He had heard this man could heal, and now he saw the only thing they had to do is touch the hem. See, and she was healed. And then it says, and when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. See, she gave the testimony. So all knew what had happened. And then verse 48 says, and he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. See, and then we read verse 49. 
while he yet spake, while Jesus was yet speaking, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house. One came from the house of Jairus, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. See, here we see something. Jairus had just grabbed more faith because he saw this woman healed. And now he's thinking, once we get to my house, if he can heal that woman, he can heal my daughter. And then the news comes. Then some news comes to him. The news of his child's welfare. When the news came, it wasn't good, was it? His, test was, his faith was tested right away. His faith was tested right away. How Satan works. You know, God's promises are true. You know, as I was talking about the son of those brethren in Mexico, you know, their faith was tested. But I want to say something. As Jair's faith was tested, and we see it was tested because his daughter had died, but we don't see in one place that he told Jesus, okay, you don't have to go. He still took Jesus to his house. Even though his faith was tested, he still believed something could be done. Amen? Those brethren, even though they knew their son could die, they still believed Jesus could still do something. And you know something? Jesus took them off of this earth, but he saved them. And Brother Iram, when we got to Mexico, he was one of the hardest men there was. He didn't want to hear anything about Jesus, anything about church. He did not want anything to do with it. But now, at the funeral, he told me, Pastor, I want you to preach, but I want you to preach on salvation. And I want you to tell those people how my son died. And then after you're done preaching, then I want to say something. And I want you to tell those people, as my son got saved, you can get saved. But I want you to tell them, don't let it come to that. Accept them today while you're still healthy. And then after I was done preaching, he went up there and he said, his tears coming down his eyes, his cheeks, I will miss my son greatly. He said, but I am so thankful that I have a gracious God. I will miss him dearly. But my faith is a lot higher and a lot stronger in God than it was before my son died. Because God showed me when it was impossible for man to keep my son alive until somebody could tell him how to be saved, God showed me he was able to do it. And my son did not die without Christ. And I will see him again because where he is, I will go, he said. See, that's, his faith got stronger. Jairus' faith got stronger because he saw this woman healed. Amen? He believed Jesus could do anything. Do we believe Jesus can do anything? If we have children that are not saved, I am not sure if there is people here that have children that are not saved. But if you have children, do you believe Jesus can save them? Bring their names before the throne of grace. And not just once. Do it frequently every day. Amen? Don't let your children be children that are underprivileged. I want each and every one of your children to be privileged children, to have parents that take the time to pray for them, to bring their names before the throne of grace. And that's what God wants from us. Amen? That's why I think Jairus was a great man, great father. He brought his child's name before the throne of grace. He brought his child's name before the throne of grace. Yes, the news was bad. His daughter was dead. But look at what Jesus says. 
But when Jesus heard it, verse 50, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And that seems like he believed it, because the Bible doesn't say he didn't. It says, and when he came into the house, see, he took him to the house right away. Jairus believed Jesus. He believed if he was able to heal that woman, he could heal his daughter, even yet. See, if we have children that are sick, Jesus can heal them. But the most important thing is that they are healed spiritually. Amen? That's the most important. See, this life is short. My grandfather, the Lord allowed me to guide my grandfather to Christ when he was 93 years of age. He was 93 when he accepted Christ as his personal savior. It took a long time to <laughs> have him understand that, but God's grace saved him. Through grace, the grace of God, he was saved. But I asked him after he was saved, Grandfather, if you could ask God for more years, how many more years would you like to live? He was 93 at that time. He said, if I had that choice, I'd ask God for at least 93 more years so I could tell all the people I've known in my life and I know now that they need Jesus in their life. He says, because these 93 years have been very short years. See, this life we live here on earth, it's short. But after we die, we step into eternity. What does that mean? There's no end. There's no end. See, and if we die in Christ, we go to paradise. Amen? How many of us want our children in paradise? All of us. Amen? So we need to bring them before the throne of grace. Yes, but those that die outside of Christ, they step into a lake of fire. See, that's the difference, where there will be suffering all eternity. See, that's why it's so important if we have family members, and I know we're talking about children, but it's family members, friends, whoever we need to tell them about what Jesus did because we don't want them to suffer. God wants all in heaven. Amen? All. Jesus went to his house, and when he came into his house, into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And what happened? And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway. So it says, and her spirit came again. That means she had been dead. But Jesus rose her from the dead. So Jesus answered Jairus' prayer. You know why? Because Jairus believed Jesus could. That's, that's why his prayer was answered. Jairus believed Jesus could. Do we believe Jesus can heal all our children? Fathers, do we believe today Jesus can heal our children? Let's bring them before the throne of grace. Jesus said, <clears throat> Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And she was. See, nothing takes Jesus by surprise. Jesus had prepared Jairus for this moment when he healed the woman along the way, I believe. 
See, walking with Jesus, we encounter faith. As Jairus was walking with Jesus, he encountered faith. If you are going to walk with Jesus every day, Dad, if I'm going to walk with Jesus every day, we are going to encounter faith. We are going to encounter faith. Amen? The daughter of this great father was healed. Healed by our great Savior. Nothing is beyond his power. This we need to believe. There is nothing that is beyond his power. See, fear not, believe only, and see what Jesus does for you. Dads, believe only, and see what Jesus will do for you. Bring yourself to the throne of grace, and bring your children's name to the throne of grace. Humble yourself before a holy God, and you will see what he can do for you. Amen.